Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Argyle Community Church this bright, sunny winter's morning. If you can start just to prepare your hearts for what a God has got to say to us this morning. Well, welcome, as I say, you're very welcome to be here, whether you're here in person, whether you're joining on the live stream, or whether you're catching up in the week. Particular welcome if you're a, a, a newcomer or you haven't been very many times before, you're very welcome to be with us, and we hope you feel uh, God's blessing on you as you worship with us this morning. Um, if you are a newcomer, we do have Connect cards uh, for you to fill in um, so that we can just know who you are and how to get in touch with you. Um, so do fill one of those in so that we can uh, keep in touch. Um, my name is Jeremy, as I expect most of you know. Um, Callum and Vita, uh, Chris and Wing will be leading us in our worship. Jamie, our pastor, will be speaking to us later on the subject of marriage. Um, and also the children will be going out for their activities at that time. Um, and later we'll be breaking bread together. Now notices are in the news sheet, um, which you should, uh, could have received as you came in. Or of course by email if you're on the distribution list. They do include the details of our sister Liz's funeral on the 9th of February, so make a note of that. Now, Alison has a notice for us. Well, good morning, everyone. We, we have a barn dance coming up on the 24th of February. Anyone who knows me knows that I absolutely love dancing. I do Scottish country dancing. Barn dancing is much, much easier. Anyone can do it. Everyone is welcome. It's fantastic fun. You can come on your own. You can come with others. And just make sure you can skip and walk in some comfortable shoes. So it's the 24th of February. Tickets are five pounds each, and we're, we'll start writing names down today, and it's, if you have the money with you, that would be fantastic. <coughs> we are having to limit the numbers because we have a limited space here where we're going to be dancing. Um, but do come along and get your tickets, five pounds each, and we have the tickets with us today. And um, I was going to say that the Scamping Rogues are the band who are going to be playing for us, a live band, which is fabulous. They're fr some of them are friends of ours. They come from another church, um, St. John's and St. Stephen's in Newtown, and they give their time and their skills to raise money for a charity of our choosing. And so we have chosen Bed for the Night as the charity we're raising money for, which is helping the homeless in Reading. So do come to me after the service if you would like to come to this event and get your name on the list and we'll give out the tickets and then we can write off your number. Thank you very much. As I say, we've come to church for probably for a variety of reasons. Um, we've come to, to, to worship, we've come to hear Jamie, we come to meet friends as well, which is lovely. Um, but perhaps the main reason we've come is to give praise uh, and worship and honour to our God. And let's do that now as we start our service with a word of prayer. Father, we do want to bring you our worship and adoration. In the words of David, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We pray for this service particularly Jamie as he speaks to us, and for the children in L-Zone and T-Zone. Bless us now, Lord, as we come to you. Amen. Amen. Over to the worship team for this song. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Gone slightly risky to start. We're singing two songs to start, and I don't think you know the first song. It's super simple. Um, I've asked Sandy already to put the words up behind me in a second so they'll appear. And I've done some research, so I know there's a few people who know this, so you can copy them. Um, so this is based on something that Jamie was talking about in his sermon a couple of weeks ago. So it's Joshua 24. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So really super simple. There's only two slides. We sing this bit twice. I'm not going to sing it through now because, as I said, we do. some people know it here, so you'll be able to pick it up. If you don't know it at the start, you'll know it by the end. It's one of those kind of songs. And then go next, next slide. 
Simple verse as well, really super simple. In this family, we're going to do things properly, read God's word every day, then we'll try to pray. Next bit. Sorry, I, I lied, there were actually. There's another slide, I forgot when I was making these. There is another slide. Next one. And then it's the other part of the verse. Although we get it wrong, we will still carry on. Oh, not quite. Not yet. A bit too eager. <laughs> okay. Make Jesus number one in this place, in this place. And then it's a really super loud bit. So I'm going to need the help from everyone, particularly at the front, but really super loud. In this place, we're going to say grace. And then back to the start. And we're just going to go around a few times. So I'm going to give it a try. If you don't know, it's fine, because we're then going to play Jesus is the name, Jesus is the name we honor after that. So one that we don't know, but it's really fun. And then one that we hopefully do know. So if you're able, let's stand to sing. That's for me in my house.
Now, last week's theme was marriage, as indeed it is today. We're having a two, two sessions on marriage. Um, now, last week, we talked about some of the different customs around weddings, and we had a little discussion about that. I heard cake and food mentioned. There were probably a few other things mentioned as well. Um, and then Jamie, after the children went out, talked to us about marriage. So if you're a child, you can't really be expected to answer the next question, can you? Because you didn't hear it. Um, but this is just to show, really, that memory verses are not just for children. Um, and can any adult finish this verse, which is going to come up on the screen in just a moment, from Genesis, which was from last week's sermon? Here we are. Any takers? Can anyone remember this key verse from last week? I'm hearing murmurs. Anyone going to stick their hand up and, 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 and be brave? Any adult? They're pretty poor, aren't they, children? Don't you think? They're pretty poor. Last week's sermon, and you've forgotten it. Oh, well, no. Oh, there is a volunteer at the back. Yes. Excellent. Well done. Right, let's have the, the full verse. Thank you. And since you were so bad, you're all going to have to say this now together, aren't we? This is a slightly more modern version than the one you quoted, but you're absolutely right. So let's say this version up here together. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. And they become one flesh. Thank you. Very good. And this underlies one of the key themes that Jamie brought to us last week, isn't it? That marriage is from God. It's blessed by God. And then Jamie went on to describe some of the distinctives of marriage, like it's between one man and one woman, and some of its purposes too, like to bring up families. Now we're now going to hear um, from some children about what they have to say about marriage. And this video is called, What Does Marriage Mean? a kid's perspective. So let's just watch the video. Do you want to get married to a girl? Yes. Oh, you do? Yes. OK, why? I don't know. Because uh, I want kids. I think most people get married because love is a really strong feeling, and marriage is a way to like show that. A lot of people think it's good. Some people think it's strange. I'd love to feel it. Are you crazy? Because I hate boys. If I were married, I would be big. They usually care about each other, and they usually smile at each other and hold hands. I'd like to feel it about someone who makes me happy, who makes me smile, who knows the right things to say, and even if he messes up, he does it in the right way. The other person likes them and they like them too. Y you'll see one day that they look e at each other when my mom's making breakfast and they smile or they say goodbye when my dad has to go to work and they just give you this warm feeling when you see them do those little things that make you feel what they're feeling. It makes me feel happy that I'm in a family that loves each other and that my parents love each other and I'm fortunate and I, it makes me feel loved and want to love everyone else. People get married because they want to spend the rest of their lives with each other. So, so you thought like me that the girl who, who spoke the most, who, whose teeth are, are still growing and had the denim jacket, um, I think she could be a marriage counsellor when she grows up. Um, but she said some pretty good things, actually, and one of which I just wanted to highlight to you now. She talked about her mum smiling at her dad. And that showed, if you like, the importance of role mod modelling good marriages. There's a lot of theory, and we looked at some theory last week, and no doubt we'll look at some theory again today as, as to what's right and what's wrong. But good practice is so important, isn't it? Um, so, right, over to Janet now, who's going to pray for us. Janet. She's disappeared. In which case, Janet. There she is. 
We heard last week, of course, that Janet is the person who's been married the longest, I think, in this church, which is marvellous. So you had to come and pray when we were talking about marriage. I'm not sure that I can really claim the longest marriage. I think it just happened to be the one in the building last week. <laughs> I'm sure there are others. But, um, anyway, let's pray. Almighty, loving God, thank you that you have been with us this last week and that your presence is with us now. Lord, we are aware that during the past week we have many times fallen short of your standards and indeed of our own standards. We have sinned in thought and word and deed. We take time now in the quietness of this moment to confess and ask for your forgiveness. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for Jamie. We pray that you will give him great inspiration as he shares with us what you have placed on his heart. Please give us receptive hearts as we listen to your word preached this morning. We pray, Lord, for the Rout family. We are so sad that Liz is no longer with us, but at the same time, we rejoice knowing that she is safe with you in heaven. We pray that Jonathan, Tim, Phil, Hannah, and their families will know the comfort that only you can give as they begin this new phase in their lives. Walk with them and guide them every step, Lord. And we pray for Janice in hospital and in so much pain. We pray that she will be given effective medication and the nurses will be kind and gentle when encouraging her to move. We pray for Ken and daughter Denise in their concern for the future. And dear God, we cry out to you on behalf of the people seriously affected by the conflicts in Gaza, Israel and Ukraine. Our hearts break at the devastation and suffering that we see, and we know that it breaks your heart too. We ask that you would stretch out your mighty hand to bring an end to these wars. We cry out for people who have been injured or traumatized who have lost loved ones or their homes. Please provide everything they need and be their comfort, their healer, and their safe refuge. We pray for your peace to reign, Lord. And we look to you as our saviour and the hope of the world. And Lord, as we walk into a new week, we ask you to be our shepherd and our protector. May our love for others be distinctive. We bring these prayers to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Janet. Gregory is now going to come and bring our reading to us. This is a reading from Ephesians 5, chapters 21 to 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does to the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother 
and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Thank you, Gregory. We're now going to sing two more songs, which uh, Callum's going to bring to us, after which the children will lead for L-Zone and for T-Zone and Kreish as well, if you're that age. Thank you. So we're going to sing two songs now, so let's stand to sing together. Lord, I lift your name on high, followed by Purify My Heart.
less, you're going in one of these many directions. Well, let's just pray for the children and young people, shall we? Lord God, we ask your blessing on L-Zone and T-Zone. Please help the teachers and the helpers. Please may they, by your spirit, be able to communicate and apply your word to the lives and hearts of the children and teenagers. We thank you for them. We lift them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our priority for the year, as you can see on the screen, is being distinctive. We're looking at what it means to be holy in the modern world. And last week we began our new sermon series on sex, marriage and singleness. And we've got uh, two sermons on marriage. And we had the first one, as Jeremy said, last week. And today is the second of two. So we're going to be... Um, Thinking more about the details, last week we looked at the biblical principles of marriage, now we're going to apply it more, and we're going to look at what the Bible says about the role of the husband and the wife within marriage. I've chosen Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 to 33 for this. Um, it's perhaps one of the most <coughs> provocative um, and difficult passages about marriage, but it's really important that we don't just ignore passages like that in, in the Bible. And we don't kind of cherry pick our favourite passages and say, I don't like those ones. I'm, I'm not going to preach on them. I'm not going to read them. It's important that we grapple with those kinds of passages and say to ourselves, well, what does the Bible say here? And, and what is God's intention here? And what does this mean for my life, especially if I'm a husband or a wife? If you're single, please don't switch off. Um, we are a community, aren't we? So it's vital that you understand marriage, God's intention for marriage, so that you can pray for and help and draw alongside those in the congregation who are married. And likewise, when we come to our two sermons on singleness, it's vital that those of us who are married don't switch off because we want to interact and support and pray intelligently and compassionately for those who are single in the church. So let's dig into the passage then and see what it says. Ephesians 5, 21 to 24. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. When we read this passage, perhaps, um, um, probably, definitely actually, the thing that really <coughs> jumps out at us, maybe shocks us, maybe even offends us, is the frequent references to submission and headship, okay? Um, especially in our modern world. So how do we approach these two aspects of marriage? Well, first of all, we note the context. Two things in particular with reference to the context. First of all, the biblical context of submission in general is that the Bible calls all Christians to humility, servanthood, and submission. The Bible portrays godly children as submissive to their parents, Ephesians 6.1, Colossians 3.20. Godly citizens as submissive to the government, Romans 13.1, Titus 3.1. Godly church members as submissive to their leaders, Hebrews 13.17. Godly workers as submissive to their employers, Colossians 3.22, 1 Peter 2.18. Godly church members to be submissive to one another, Ephesians 5.21, and godly wives 
as submissive to their husbands, the passage that we've just read, but also Colossians 3.18 and 1 Peter 3.1. And also the Bible says all Christians are to submit to Christ and are submit, to submit to the word of God as their authority. When you become a Christian, you're saying, my authority is now the Bible as given by God. But also we see that Christ submitted to his father, Luke 22, 42. And astonishingly, Christ submitted to his disciples in the sense of becoming their servant in John 15 by washing their feet. He adopted this submissive, submissive serving attitude towards them. Jesus said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, Matthew 20, 26. And Paul said, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look out only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, Philippians 2, 3 and 4. So humility, servanthood, submission in the Bible are, are not some weird sexist restrictions for wives. They are extensive and foundational for Christians. The context for Christian wives submitting to their husbands is in the larger context of all Christians having submissive, humble, servant hearts. So that's the context of the Bible, but we also need to note the um, cultural context in, in which Paul was when he was writing. So the cultural context of um, Ephesus and, and the Ephesian Christians in Ephesus meant that the Christian husband was to be a source of dignity and protection for his wife in a culture in which, sadly, women were regularly exploited or abused by other men. Um, or by their husbands. Paul is saying, no, that must not happen. In Christian marriage, women were to submit to their husband in order to be blessed by them. Uh, the sense is the husband is the head of the wife, not other men, not the mother-in-law, nor anyone else. The husband, to protect the wife, the husband is to be a loving, giving, caring, self-sacrificial head to her. So it becomes the one who understands her most, who is devoted to her, who loves her best, who is her ally and her friend. He is the one who is to be her protective and authoritative head. So that's the context, that the biblical context and the cultural context. Let's think now about the specifics of the wife submitting to the husband as her head. The Greek word submit means to put under. So the meaning is subjecting oneself to the leadership or the authority of another. Head can mean three things actually, literally the, the head on, on the body, figuratively a person in authority, or it can mean source, as in the source or the head of a river. The meaning here is figuratively um, authority. So the wife is called to put herself, not be put, we should know, but put herself under the authoritative headship of her husband. So let's pause and, and now think about what that means, because I can hear some of you thinking, what? I can't believe the Bible says that. Like, is this true? Like, this just seems so off. Let's think about that and, and what that means, the wife putting herself under the authoritative headship of the husband. I think it's important that we, we note, first of all, what submission is not. Because sadly, because of sin, submission has been abused over the centuries and the headship of the husband has been misused and the wife has been harmed. So um, Femi Osanui, the lead pastor of City Church in Nigeria, notes four things that submission is not about. First of all, submission is not about gender inferiority. The Bible does not teach that females are inferior to males. As we saw last week, God created 
both male and female in his image, conferring on them, therefore, equal worth, dignity and value. And Christian men and women are both equally given the same spirit of God. It's not like men get more of the spirit and women less because they're inferior. No, they are equally given the same spirit of God himself. So submission does not mean inferiority. It refers to role, not status. <coughs> the biblical understanding of submission assumes equality, not hierarchy. So the one doing the submitting is not considered inferior. And we know this because of passages like Luke 22, 42 and 1 Corinthians 11, 3, where God the Son submits to God the Father. 1 Corinthians 11, 3 says, But I want you to realise that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So Christ submits to the Father. But that doesn't mean he's inferior to God. He's equally divine and equally powerful and equally able and equally worthy of praise. So submission does not mean gender inferiority. Submission also does not, uh, is not generically applicable. These verses do not mean that women everywhere are to submit to all men. They don't mean that. They are specifically talking about wives submitting to their own husbands in Christian marriage. And then submission is not gender servitude. These verses do not imply that the wife is the servant of the husband and the husband is the boss or the master of the wife. Professor Preston Sprinkle says, Paul never says that wives are inferior to their husbands. And the overwhelming emphasis in the passage is on the husband's self-giving, self-sacrificial, unconditional service toward his wife. No one in Paul's day would have read this passage and thought he was demeaning women. They would have been shocked, actually, at his excessive demands of the husband. So submission does not mean gender servitude. And then lastly, submission is not absolutely applicable. Wives submitting to their husbands does not mean that if a husband tells or asks his wife to do something sinful or to submit to a sinful action or to do something against her conscience, she should do it. She should not do it if he asks her that. If the husband puts the wife in a place where she will be abused physically or emotionally or mentally or sexually, she is not obligated to submit to him. We know this because of verse 22, which says, Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. To submit as to the Lord means if the husband asks his wife to do something displeasing to the Lord, she will obey her Lord rather than her husband. Jesus would never ask his beloved church to do something sinful. He would never harm her or make her do something demeaning. So a wife must not submit to anything sinful or harmful that her husband might ask her to do. Verse 24 says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now that phrase, in everything, means in every area of life, married life, but it does not mean do absolutely and unquestioningly everything he tells you to do, even if it's sinful. And it can't mean that because of the analogy of Christ and the church. Paul makes it very clear that the husband is head of the church as, sorry, the husband is head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. And therefore a husband's leadership and headship cannot mean mistreating the wife and expecting her to submit to mistreatment. Rather, it means treating the wife with the love, the care, the self-giving, self-sacrifice that Christ gives his church. 
So that's what submission is not. And as I said, it's important to go through that and spend time on that because sadly, submission has been misused and misapplied in the past. But let's now think about what submitting to the husband is. And the key here is Christ. If, if we don't look at him, then we will misinterpret Ephesians 5, 22 and 24. And we're at risk of misusing these directives. So look at verses 22 and 24. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So these verses reveal to us that to understand submission of the wife to the husband, we must look at how the church submits to Christ. That's the correct way of understanding it. So how does the church submit to Christ? How do we, as Christians, submit to our Lord? Well, we allow him to lead us, don't we? We accept that he has authority. We let him love us, give ourselves to him. We, we trust him. We realise that he is for us. And he loves us and cares for us and he wants to meet our needs. So, with that in mind, a wife submitting to her husband is allowing her husband to lead her. It's accepting he has authority over her. It's letting him love her. And it's trusting him. And it's also realising that he's for her and he deeply cares for her and has her best interests at heart and aims to meet her needs. That's what it means for a, a wife to submit to her husband. Now, she submits not because she's inferior to her husband. She submits as his equal. She is equally made in God's image, equal in value, worth and dignity. She submits to her husband as her God-ordained leader, servant leader, just as Jesus is the servant king. She submits realising that her submission and her husband's headship are both dramatically opposed to self-interest. I'll say that again. It's a really important phrase. She submits, realising that her submission and her husband's headship are both dramatically opposed to self-interest. And a marriage where both partners are opposed to self-interest is a healthy marriage. <laughs> it's going to go well. She submits, saying to her husband, I like you taking initiative in our family. I want you to do that. I'm glad when you take responsibility for things and lead with love. I don't flourish when you're passive and I certainly don't flourish when you misuse your headship. Now submission does not mean that a wife can't question her husband. Actually the, what the Bible is full of prophets and poets and psalmists questioning God. Um, we're allowed, wives are allowed to question their husband, of course. And submission may well mean reminding your husband that he's not acting in a way that is helping you to submit. This is um, Rosemary Miller, um, wife of the late Jack Miller. Some of you may have heard of him or read some of his books. I've, I've met her a few times, and, and I've read one of her books, and she is a, a godly woman who commands respect by her Christ-likeness, so we can learn from her. Now, back in 1983, she wrote a letter to her husband in order to remind him that he was not acting in a way that was helping submission. Um, he was a pastor, she was a pastor's wife, I'm going to read you that letter now uh, as an example of a wife gently challenging her husband 
and saying, look, you've got to examine your headship here. So here, it's a very moving letter. Here's the letter that she wrote to her husband. As I watch you in your struggles and labours and your desire to be God's man in this 20th century, I also see the mission work and the church taking your time and energies. They are the sum of your deepest joys and greatest fears. You nourish and cherish them as a bridegroom his bride. When we wake up in the morning, your thoughts are usually on the church, the discipleship group, neighbours, church, your writing, the missions team, and your teaching and preaching. Your daytime energies are directed in these areas, and at night they are still with you. I don't mean to imply that this is all in the energy of the flesh. No one could do all these things unless empowered by the Holy Spirit. I am saying that, as I study Ephesians 5, I read that there is a holy energy that goes into marriage from the husband to the wife. The other day, when I asked if we could have tea together or just go out, I wanted to say some of these things. But your response was, I thought we'd have, eno we'd have enough of our problems. I forgive you. And I forgive you for making the church and the mission your first love, but I'm not sure I am helping you by keeping quiet. I have learned to accept this as a way of life, but is it God's norm? You often say you want to be a man controlled and compelled by the promises of scripture, a man of prayer and patience and a perpetual learner. God is making you all of this, but I rarely hear how you desire to be taught how to nourish and cherish your wife as Christ does the church. I think that's a powerful letter, isn't it? That's, it's powerful because it's written with such gentleness, but with such challenge as well. He, he clearly wasn't being the head he should have been, and she was struggling to submit, therefore. So she tells him. And wives should tell their husbands, gently, if they're not the heads they should be, and if they're struggling to submit. Submission doesn't mean we, wives just be quiet and don't say anything and just unquestioningly obey. It involves a dialogue. So I think Rosemarie Miller is a great example of how to approach your husband if he is neglecting or misusing his headship. I don't mean like literally write a letter, but, but just that, that ability to, to gently challenge the husband. That's really important. Because the husband's not perfect, right? Not at all. We need challenging from time to time. And uh, I find that letter personally really convicting because sometimes I fall into the same errors as, as a pastor myself, neglect Claire, make the church my bride, and that's not right. So let's continue. Notice that in Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, uh, what Paul does, he doesn't spell out all the details. He doesn't give long lists of, of how to do it in married life. He just lays down the principle. So I think we have to acknowledge that submission um, in marriage will vary from country to country, from culture to culture, and certainly from marriage to marriage. It needs working out between the married couple, and that will take time and effort and pain and energy. Um, it will require the husband to say humbly to his wife, how can I help you submit? And the wife to tell him honestly, and discussion and prayer, and more discussion and prayer, and a working out of how that works in practice. So that's the principle, but maybe you're still thinking, but why? <laughs> why does the wife have to be, have to be submissive? Like, like, why does God say that? Why didn't Paul just save ink and, and save me a lot of headache this week? Just writing, husbands and wives have the same uh, authority and roles in marriage. There you go, done. Why didn't you say that? Well, two reasons, one practical and one 
transcendent. And again, I borrow from Pastor Femi Osanui. First of all then, um, practical reason why Paul says this. So when you've got two people who are equally valuable, equally worthy, they're part of a team, and they've come, um, and they need to make a decision, but they've come to an impasse, you know, there's, there's like a deadlock, they, they can't agree. They've given both of their opinions and they've thoroughly exhausted all of the options. When that happens, somebody has to lead. And the Bible says that the husband is the head in this regard. And so when that happens, his view will take precedence. Of course, he's directed by self-giving and the interests of his wife putting them first. But somebody has to make a decision. Um, they can't move ahead otherwise. Somebody has to lead. So it's very practical. So that's the, the practical reason. And then there's the transcendent reason, which is the relationship between a man and a wife depicts the gospel. Christ lovingly and joyfully sacrificed himself for the bride, his church, didn't he? The church responds in love and lovingly and joyfully submits to her bridegroom. And when a husband and a wife act like that, they act out the gospel. They communicate something of Christ's relationship to his people. And it's beautiful. And it's wonderful. And it's transcendent. One more reason, this time from Linda Alcock, because I just want you to know that I didn't just read uh, the opinions of a load of men on this. Um, I, I went to a talk, actually, by this lady, um, and I've watched videos of women discussing this topic and read books written by women and articles written by women. So Linda Alcock says, uh, she gives the reason of, of compl it compliments, complimentary. So as we thought last week, husband and wife are a union of other. Do you remember that? They are the same and yet different. So when they come together in marriage, they complement each other by their differences. And when they do that, they're, they're more productive, more settled, more able. They work better as a team. In her talk, she kept on saying, this lady, Linda Alcock, she kept on saying, one plus one equals three. And I was like, what? <laughs> what does she mean? But what she meant was when, when we decide to do marriage God's way, we're more, there's more pr product, productiveness. The one and the one produce more than if they're doing it some other way. She was saying it's a good thing because, because they fit together, they complement each other, and they work better that way. When husband and wife decide to commit to God's ordained and designed roles, and they both believe very strongly they're equal in value, worth, and dignity, they get more out of their marriage and they become more fruitful and give to others, their children, their family, the church, friends, etc., out of that um, submission to God's will for their marriage. So that's the reason why. Practical, transcendent, and complementary. But it's hard still. It's hard, especially in a fallen world. It's hard. So I just want to give uh, all the wives here four things uh, to help you if you're struggling with submission. Um, first of all, uh, if you remember these four things, it might help you find submission a bit easier. Remember, first of all, Christ submits. That's so surprising, isn't it? We read that in the Bible. Paul is not telling you to do anything that Christ himself hasn't done. I find that stunning. He submitted himself to his father as his head. He submitted all the way to the cross and suffering and death. That doesn't mean he's lesser or inferior. It doesn't mean he's not equal to his father. It rather means that he's willing to take his assigned role in the relationship, which is a selfless, self-denying role. So keep that in mind. Secondly, um, you are being asked by God to submit to a husband who is commanded to be devoted to you in self-sacrificial love. That's God's plan. God isn't asking you to submit to a tyrant to allow yourself to be mistreated. His desire for you is for your husband to love you with Christ's self-sacrificial love. That's a good thing. God's ideal is a wonderful thing. Thirdly, God is not telling you 
to do anything he hasn't empowered you to do by the Spirit. This passage in Ephesians 5, it's interesting because in the Greek there's just like this one massive long sentence which starts in verse 18, which says, be filled with the Spirit. So before he gives his directives, he's saying, be filled with the Spirit. He's saying, you can only do this with the Spirit. You think, wives, maybe, I can't do this. You're right, you can't. But you can with the Spirit. God will help you. And then fourthly, theologian Tom Wright says, if this guideline seems outrageous in today's culture, we should ask ourselves, do our modern societies, in which marriage is often a tragedy or a joke, really offer a better model of how to do it? Food for thought there, isn't there? I think he makes a good point. I think he's right. Our society does make marriage into a tragedy or a joke. It makes it into a joke. Think Love Island and Married at First Sight on TV. It just makes a joke of marriage. And the tragedy of less people getting married because less desire for commitment, um, the pain and fallout of divorce, the rise of children whose dads are absent, etc., etc. There's a tragedy about marriage in the way our modern society does it. So we ask ourselves, is it really much better? Or is God's way better? So I would say to you, Wives, if you're struggling, try it. <laughs> try submitting. Try trusting God that his commands are good. Um, step out of the boat, as it were. You know, remember that story? The disciples are in the boat in the storm. Jesus says, step out. It's like, that's crazy. Why would I step out into the, the waves? But Peter stepped out with trust. This seems like a crazy command. Just step out into it with trust. God's commands are good for us. See what it does to your marriage. Give it a go. So there's some advice if you're struggling to submit. But I just want to ask this question and address it briefly. What if your husband is not a Christian? How does submission work then? Well, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, the word of God, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your purity and reverence to God will deeply affect your husband. That's what Paul's saying. As we've seen, submission does not mean you can't question him or reason with him, or refuse to obey him if he leads you into sin. But remember, submission is powerful. Powerful enough to win your husband over to God. Incredible what the verse is saying, isn't it? Or implying. That's a word for wives whose husbands are not Christians. So there we have it. The wife submitting to her husband the head. Now, if Paul left it there, it probably would end up sexist or patriarchal, but he moves on to explain the husband's role in marriage. And we must note at this point, Paul gives three times more space to the husband um, uh, and his role in marriage than he does to the wife. So husbands, we need to take note. Let's get to it then. The husband's role in marriage. Um, so we've seen that the husband is the head that God said he's the authority, the one with leadership in marriage. But what kind of head is he supposed to be? Verse 25 tells us, a loving head. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The husband is not to be domineering or controlling or chauvinistic or demeaning quite the opposite because Paul's focus here as you can see in that verse is on the husband showing self-giving self-sacrificial unconditional love to his wife he is to love her as Christ loves the church and as I was studying this I thought you know we might find it quite shocking what Paul says to wives but when we sit down and think about it it's also quite shocking what he says to husbands because he's saying completely give yourself up for your wife even to the point of suffering and death because that's how Christ did it like he came not to be served but to serve 
There was a point, you remember, he took off his outer clothing. He wrapped a towel around his waist. He knelt down. He assumed the posture of a servant. And he washed his disciples' feet. And then he willingly and voluntarily gave himself up to the cross in complete, utter self-denial. Paul is saying to husbands, love your wife like that. Love your wife in a costly way. Totally give yourself to her. Serve her. Make sacrifices for her. Give yourself up for her. Really radical. And notice Paul's emphasis here. It's on Christ's sacrifice, not on his lordship. Yes, husbands lead their wives, but that leadership is of a wife who is his equal, not as someone who is inferior or lesser. We are not to lord it over our wives, but to serve them as our Lord came to, not to be served, but to serve. In addition to marriage headship, meaning husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, Paul says husbands must love their wives as they love themselves. And he says this in verses 28 and 33. He repeats himself for emphasis. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. So the golden rule of marriage is, you shall love your wife as yourself. So what does that mean? Well, just as I instinctively get away from pain and avoid harm, I must protect my wife from anything that could damage her. Just as I am aware of how I feel, physically and emotionally, I must be sensitive to my wife's feelings and emotions. Just as I really appreciate people treating me courteously, so I must put my wife first, treating her with care and courtesy. Just as I communicate with myself, listen to my thoughts and take notice of them, I must work at good communication with my, life, my wife, especially listening to her. So what does all this mean in practice um, for, for the husband then? Let's think about that. Well, first of all, it will mean different things, but they're all to be self-sacrificial things. Um, as with the wife, Paul just gives the principle. He doesn't go into the detail. He leaves us to work that out ourselves. Of course, headship will probably mean different things in different cultures, in different families, and people with different personalities. But they'll all be self-sacrificial. That's the principle. So, for example, it might mean staying home two nights a week, looking after the kids and changing their nappies as your wife finishes her master's degree, maybe, for example. It will definitely mean treating her as someone special, treating her as someone wonderful. Uh, I heard this story, okay? Years ago, in the Midwest, the story was told of a farmer and his wife who were lying in bed during a storm when suddenly the funnel of a tornado lifted the roof right off their house and sucked their bed up away with them still in it. The wife began to cry. The farmer called out to her that it was no time to cry, but she called back and said she couldn't help it. She was so happy. It was the first time that they'd been out together in 20 years. <laughs> Husbands, treat your wife special. Take her out. Surprise her. Spend some money on her. Don't neglect her. She's a wonderful person. Don't take her for granted. That's what being the head means. Second, it means shouldering the greatest burdens in marriage. Here's a great quote from David Mathis. He says, for the husband, being head in his home doesn't center on his enjoying the greatest privileges, but on shouldering the greatest burdens. Being head means going ahead in conflict and being the first to apologize. It means taking initiative when no one else wants to. It means treating his co-manager with unrelenting kindness, even when she's less than kind. It means exercising true strength by inconveniencing himself to secure her good rather than serving himself by presuming on her. And of course, it includes vigilance in being a one-woman man, utterly committed in mind, heart, and body to his one wife. 
when I got engaged to Claire, um, I uh, was in the car park. I had just finished church in the evening. I was in the church car park and I was going home on my own. Um, and uh, I was just unlocking my car door. And uh, a hand, a heavy hand, that was laid on my shoulder. And it was one of our elders called Ron. And uh, he gave me a talk <laughs> there in the car park. But he said to me, you're going to be married soon and you're the head of your wife. What does that mean? And I was like, uh, I was only in my 20s. I was like, hmm, thinking, I'm sure you want to tell me. But um, I couldn't really think of anything. Anyway, he, he kind of, he took his hand off my shoulder and he said, it means, James, you take the initiative. You move towards sorting out the disagreements. You do all you can to mend the relationship after a fallout. It's you. It's on you. You take control in that area, pointing at me all the time. I was like, wow, okay. But that's good advice. It really is. Because it means that we just don't let the silence continue. We don't just um, say, I'm not talking to her. We are the first to apologize. We want to sort things out. We try and make it right. We take the initiative. Thirdly, loving our wives as Christ loved the church means studying her needs and doing all we can to meet them. Because that's what Christ does for us, isn't it? He knows our needs. He knows we're weak and frail. And he gives his spirit to help us. So it means asking her, how can I love you well? It's what we should do from time to time as husbands. How can I love you better? What can I do that will help me be a better head? It means me second, her first. It means finding joy in meeting her needs. Verse 29 says, No one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. So just as we are attentive to what our bodies need and we feed and care for them, so we need to be attentive to what our wife, wife needs. We need to care for our wives, just as we care for ourselves and Christ does the church. Fourthly, being head means the husband is to attend to the spiritual welfare of the wife. And we see this in verses 25 to 28. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives. Now, of course, this verse doesn't mean that husbands make their wives holy and wash them from sin. That's Christ's job. But husbands are to attend carefully to the spiritual welfare of their wives. <coughs> to care for them and do all they can to help them grow closer to Christ. One Bible commentator I read poses this challenging question to husbands. You ready, husbands? Is our wife more like Christ because she is married to us? Or is she like Christ in spite of us? Whatever our effect, our call is clear, sanctifying love. I thought that was really challenging. Is our wife more like Christ because she is married to us? She should be. We should help them in their spiritual walk. Attending to her spiritual welfare means, of course, that we pray for and with our wives. R. Kent Hughes, author and Bible teacher, says we pray for their spiritual life, obligations, pressures, friendships and dreams, daily and passionately, for that is how Christ prays for us. That's what, then, it means for a husband to love his wife. That's what Christian husband headship means in practice. And I can't emphasize enough, being head does not mean dominating your wife. There's no way that Christ would harm or humiliate his church, is there? Of course he wouldn't mistreat his bride. So there's no way that we can possibly do that either. Actually, it means the opposite. And when we do that, when we help and love our wives, to submit in the way that Christ commands them to. We reflect Christ. We shine forth the gospel and we make our marriages strong. Let's just take a few minutes now to be silent, to pause, to reflect on and digest 
what we've heard. And then I'll pray. I'm conscious that a sermon like this, indeed a series like this on sex, marriage and singleness, can be very painful for some. Because we aren't all happily married enjoying sex or happily single enjoying celibacy. In any church, there will be those who are married who wish they were single. Those who are single who wish they were married those who were married, but their marriages ended in death, divorce, desertion or disappointment. There will be those with problems in their marriage and problems in their singleness. And many of us who are married will struggle to work out God's will for our relationship in terms of submission and headship. So now Claire and I are going to pray for God's help and God's healing and God's blessing in these areas. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, we pray for those here who are struggling with the pain of life on earth with sin affecting sex, marriage, and singleness. We ask for your help. Please give grace and patience and kindness and understanding where it's needed. We particularly pray for those who have had or who are experiencing pain in their marriage or their singleness. Compassionate God, please be near them. Bind up their wounds and heal their broken hearts. Help them to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. We pray for those in unhappy marriages. We pray for those whose marriages have ended in divorce or death. Help them, Lord. Be close to them. Heal their wounds help them recover. We also pray for children damaged by unhappy marriages or divorce. Please give them everything they need in their situation. And we pray for those who are struggling with their singleness, struggling with loneliness or unrequited love or sexual temptation. Fill them with your spirit. Comfort them. Give them your strength and patience, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Just pause a moment. If, if what Jamie has prayed has brought any people to your mind right now, I just have this few moments to bring them before God and ask for his help. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We rejoice that in you, Jesus, we will be sustained. You give us eternal life, and you give us strength to journey through each day with all its challenges, 
pain and disappointments. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Thank you, Jesus, that you know what it is to suffer. You came down humbly, living the life we could not, paying the debt we could not pay, dying in our place, redeeming us with your precious blood. We ask that you forgive us when we fail to follow you as we should. Help us to see afresh your love poured out at Calvary. And now if we have any things we need to confess before our Father, let us silently bring them to him now, asking for his forgiveness. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We yield to your way, Father, not ours. We believe your truth, Father, not the lies of the accuser. We look to you, Father, the giver of life. Amen. Amen. Okay, Claire, please... Um don't hesitate to chat to me or Claire. If you're struggling in your marriage or in your singleness, we'd love to listen to you and pray for you. We're approaching the time when we're going to have communion together. So uh, to prepare ourselves for that. to prepare ourselves for that we're going to worship come let's sing of a wonderful love the stand to sing
Please be seated. We're now coming to the Lord's Supper, which we're going to remember together. And I thought what I'd do just to focus our mind on the Lord's Supper is to read some words to you from Philip Jensen, the Australian preacher, just to help focus our minds. We celebrate the death of our Lord and Saviour by eating and drinking around the table. The meal we eat has been reduced to its barest elements. We do not, do not eat the whole Passover as Jesus and his disciples did. We only eat a small piece of bread and drink, drink a sip of wine. So this eating bread and drinking wine reminds us of his body broken in death and the covenant signed in his blood, the covenant of forgiveness and pardon. In the activity of eating and drinking, we participate in this memorial. The bread remains bread and the wine remains wine, but we eat and drink in remembrance of him. We share with each other in his death for us. Our unity is to be a real unity of living in love and charity with each other, forgiving each other, and being reconciled to each other. It is symbolized in eating and drinking together in remembrance of Christ's sacrificial death. Let me just read you the words from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray now as we come before the Lord's Supper. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus' saving action on the cross. We do thank you that Jesus died for us, and we can remember that in the taking of bread. And we thank you for the new covenant that you've made in Jesus' blood that we can remember through taking the wine. We thank you that we have the promise that we can enjoy you forever. And thank you that we can be in fellowship with one another now. Amen. If you know and love the Lord as your Saviour, we do welcome you to come and take part in this remembrance. But if you don't, we just ask that you stay in your seat. The stewards will now direct you row by row to come up the centre aisle. Take the bread and the wine. Go back to your seat. You can eat the bread straight away. But if you hold on to the cup, we'll do that together. So if the stewards can now... Uh, guide us to take the bread and the wine. to win. 
Give thanks to you, O Lord. Over to Callum and the team now for the last song. We're going to close our worship today song that I always associate with marriage because we had it on our wedding day and I'm sure a lot of people will share that with us as well we're going to sing, stand to sing together our final closing hymn, one of the great hymns, Love Divine
seated. Well, thank you for coming or watching if you joined us on the live stream. Thanks to all those who have made this service possible, whether up here at the front or at the back with the technical teams and stewards. Tea and coffee will be served after the service, so please join us in that. Um, and as we think about growing in God's likeness, let's close by saying the grace to one another. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.